University Video Communications is pleased to present this video edition of the distinguished lecture series, Industry Leaders in Computer Science and Electrical Engineering. This presentation is by Dan Ingalls of Apple Computer on object-oriented programming. Ingalls was principal designer of four generations of Smalltalk, the prototypical object-oriented programming language. He received the Grace Murray Hopper Award for his work on Smalltalk and bitmap graphics at Xerox Park in the 1970s. He joined Apple Computer in 1984, where his most recent work has been in the area of visual programming languages, or KITS. Please join us in welcoming Dan Ingalls. I had the good fortune to participate in the Smalltalk project with Alan Kay and the other good people who worked on it. And it was an interesting project. We designed a programming language and then used it to build an operating system and a graphical user interface. And then built on top of that uh, a whole programming environment consisting of editors, debuggers, compilers. And then used those to implement several large applications such as a music system and an animation system. And then we had the opportunity to do something which most other projects don't get to do, which is when it was all built, instead of going commercial and delivering it, we got to throw it all away and do it over again the way we would have wanted to do it. And uh, in the process, we got to find out about complexity <clears throat> because the applications were quite complex. And we had a chance to try out several uh, solutions to dealing with that complexity. And when you uh, try, to, try to break a complex problem down, you want to try to break it down into as, as few parts as you can. And you want them to be as independent as they can be. Uh, that just leaves, leaves you with a simpler analysis. And then if you have general parts that you've put together uh, or that you have available, when you use them to put together a system, uh, it will be easier to learn because there are uh, fewer components. Uh, you can be more productive because the components are hopefully more general. And the systems you build will be more maintainable because built with fewer components, you'll encounter less things you don't know about when you go in to maintain it. Now, if you look at the evolution of uh, computer software systems over the last uh, <clears throat> 40 years or so, uh, you find that we started out with incredibly basic uh, components that were not at all flexible, just the instructions of the machine and the memory cells available in it. Then on top of that, we put a more general layer with formulas for the instructions, uh, a symbolic sort of description, and variables instead of simple memory cells. And then we <clears throat> added in the notion of procedures, which sort of uh, made a much more flexible kit of things to work with, because now you could augment the basic set of instructions that were available. And then soon after that time, we also developed data structures, which again allowed you to define your own new uh, memory primitives, as it were. And at each level, it became possible to break problems down more simply and more generally. Uh, then, toward the uh, end of the 60s, the beginning of the 70s, we discovered, if, as we tried to do more and more complicated things, we discovered further problems, for, inst for instance, the use of go-tos in procedural text uh, that made things not be modular, and we ruled that out with structured programming principles. And also, in the area of data structures, people were using data structures in unclean ways, and we cleaned that up by uh, the use of abstract data types where you, uh, you basically bundle uh, the data with the procedures that work on it and hide the information behind. So this is where we were at the, uh, at the beginning of the 70s. Uh, and the problem is that one still encountered difficulties when building really complex systems. For instance, if you do a large simulation uh, of a hospital or something like that, you'll have several different kinds of data uh, in that simulation. For instance, in a hospital, you might have doctors, nurses, and patients. And in building data structures for this simulation, you'll presumably implement structures for things like queues, uh, for instance, the queue of people waiting at a door. And some programming languages at that time required you to have a different kind of queue for every kind of thing you're going to put into it. Now, as soon as you get to a large simulation, that becomes impossibly difficult. 
Or in this example, uh, you would have doctors, nurses, and patients <clears throat> all waiting at the elevator sometimes or at a door. So it requires the queue to be able to have all these different kinds of things in it. And there will be code like this scattered all over the system. Uh, now, what you have to do then is inside of the queue, and this is even if the programming language allows you to do this, you'll have to have a test on what kind of thing is in the queue. Uh, for instance, if you want to display everything in the queue, you'd have a test which tests the type of the thing, the element in the queue, and then depending on whether it's a doctor, it would call the display doctor routine. If it's a nurse, it would call the display nurse routine, and so on. Uh, it would be unlikely to have a window in waiting for a door, but that's, you might have code in the system that did that as well. And as, as you build up a large system this way, you'll have at first 10 and soon 100 versions of this kind of code scattered around the system. And it becomes a nightmare to maintain. Uh, it's also harder to build because you just have the sheer bulk of all that code to write. It's harder to modify because you have to maintain consistency. If you go and change one thing, you've got to change all those places where it occurred. It's also harder to understand because if you come into a system that's built this way, uh, you can't see the forest for the trees. You're just uh, confronted with a mountain of irrelevant detail. And the example here is if, uh, if you wanted to add janitors now to this simulation, you'd have to go back and fix up all those places. Um, which would be a chore, and that's assuming that you found all the places that you needed to fix up, and you get bugs and inconsistencies in that regard. So there's a principle at work here, which is that uh, if any part of a system depends on the internals of another part, then complexity increases as the square of the size of the system. In other words, in each of these places, we've got a piece of code that's getting bigger and bigger, not just because of what it does, but because the rest of the system is getting larger. And you can sort of see this graphically if you think of the, uh, these little circles as the number of parts of the system uh, and the blue lines as the interactions between them. They get to be more and more blue lines until you get a forest that you simply can't deal with. This is truly a limitation to what you can humanly accomplish. There are a couple of approaches you can go from there. Uh, you can stick with simple problems. That's sort of the academic approach. And then there's the industrial military approach, which is to mount enormous efforts. But there's actually a better way. In other words, the complexity you have is not so much intrinsic to the task you're trying to do. It results from the point of view you have about what you're doing. And it was the people who worked on Simula who first ran into this problem and saw a way to uh, deal with these situations more simply. What they did was to sort of change from the procedural view, which is that in these procedures you have to do a dispatch on the types of the objects. And they flipped it around to the other point of view, which is the object-oriented one, which is that within every type of object, you have all the procedures that work on it. And so in addressing an object, you need to dispatch on the procedure you want to call. So if we go back and look at the situation we had before, uh, it can be represented pretty much this way. You're testing on the type of the object uh, that you're wanting to uh, operate on, say print in the queue. Uh, you test if its type is A, then call A's version of print. If the type is B, then call B's version of print. And if the type is C, then call C's version of print. You can collapse that down into one more general statement, uh, which is just to call X's types version of print. And then you can still simplify that some more if you see this as addressing X and asking to have something done as sending the message print to the object and letting the object do it itself however it wants to. And if you go even farther, if you decide that you're going to do everything in your language this way, then you don't need to have this sort of send to circumlocution. And you can just write X print or X operate, whatever. So let me take a minute and just describe how Smalltalk does this. Smalltalk gives you a syntax uh, for both simple operations, such as asking for something size, uh, 
or printing an object, where you would just say a size. That would send a message size to the object a and return size.